Section 10.3, the ideal gas equation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the relationships of Boyle's, Charles's, and Avogadro's law to develop another relationship, which is a little bit like the combined gas law. So if you remember, what we said from Boyle's law was that the volume was proportional to 1 over the pressure. Right? That's Boyle. And then we said that the volume was proportional to the temperature in Kelvin, and that was Charles's law, or Guy Lussac, if you want to use that one. And then there was Avogadro's law, which said that the volume was proportional to the number of moles of the gas. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these three proportionalities and put them together into one equation. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to write it this way. Volume is proportional to 1 over T. I'm sorry, 1 over P. But volume is also proportional to T. And it's also proportional to N. So you see how I've put all those together? So let me write this a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as nT over P. Okay. Then I'm going to say the following. To turn it from a proportionality into an equality, we're going to multiply it by some number that makes them equal. And I'm going to use the symbol R for that proportionality. And then I'm going to change it one more time by just changing the order in the numerator. NRT divided by P. So the volume of a gas is equal to the number of moles of the gas times a proportionality constant, R, times the temperature, T, divided by the pressure, P. Okay. This is sometimes called the ideal gas law or the ideal gas equation. Historically, it was called the perfect gas law. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about R. R is called the universal, meaning it works for any ideal gas constant. And the value of R depends on the units you use. If you use atmospheres for pressure and liters for volume, and we definitely want to use moles and Kelvin for N and, and T, the value of R would be 0.082057. It can take on other units as well, but that's the one that you'll use most of the time. Okay. Now, what I want to do is rewrite the equation by multiplying both sides by P, and then we get PV equals NRT. And you may have seen the in high school or somewhere else, you may have seen this form of this ideal gas law. PV equals NRT. The pressure of the gas times the volume of the gas is equal to the moles of the gas times this universal gas constant times the temperature of the gas. Now, it is often the case that experiments are run under a temperature of zero degrees Celsius, which in Kelvin would be 273.15, and one atmosphere. If that is the case, then we would say that this is happening under standard temperature and pressure conditions. STP for short. 
Okay, so if you ever see that in a problem where it says it occurred, the experiment occurred at STP, that's a way of telling you that the temperature was 273.15 Kelvin and that the pressure was one atmosphere. Now, the significance of STP is that if you plug in the value of one mole of a gas, if you put in one mole, and you put in the 0.082057 atmosphere liters per mole Kelvin, so that's R, right? And then multiply that by 273.15 Kelvin, and then divide that by one atmosphere, what you get is 22.41 liters per mole. Okay, actually you get 22.4 liters. Let me just put that in there as liters. In other words, under STP conditions, the volume of one mole of a gas is 22.41 liters. Okay, so that's sometimes called a constant. The volume of an ideal gas, if you have one liter, is 22.41 liters. So what happens if you have two moles, or three moles, or four moles? Well, if you have twice the amount of gas, according to Avogadro's law, you would have twice the volume. So what we can do is we can say that the volume of a gas at STP is equal to 22.41 liters per mole. times the number of moles of the gas. So if you have 10 moles of gas, you would just say, okay, 22.41 liters per one mole, multiply that by 10 moles, you'd get 224.1 liters. So that's a nice convenient relationship if things are occurring at STP. They're often not, but sometimes they are. Now, another interesting relationship and useful relationship is the issue of density, the relationship between the density of a gas and its molar mass. So let's remind ourselves that density is mass divided by volume, right? And so notice that volume is in this definition of density but it's also in the ideal gas law. So I'm gonna write the ideal gas law down over here on the right. And notice that volume is in each of those equations. I'm gonna take the dot off because there is a connotation of a dot over the V that I don't want to confuse here. Okay, so density is mass over volume in the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. Now there's also another relationship, which is that the molar mass of a gas, or of any substance, of any pure substance, is the mass of the substance divided by moles, M for mass, N for moles. So notice this has mass in it as well. So density and molar mass both have mass, but they also, density has volume and molar mass has moles, which are two quantities, two variables, that you find in the ideal gas equation. So that's an interesting relationship. We can actually connect these three equations together. So there's different ways to go about this. I'm just gonna show you one way, and you don't have to worry about doing this yourself. I just wanna show you where I'm gonna come up with it. The results are what are important here. And the issue here is, suppose we did the following. Suppose we took this density equation and wrote it as volume is equal to mass over density, right? You see how we do that? We can multiply both sides by volume and then divide both sides by density. And then I'm gonna substitute in that relationship or that ratio in here. So that now gives us P times M over D equals NRT. Interesting, right? Now I'm gonna do another thing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, oh, 
Okay, the ideal gas law also has moles in it, N, but so does molar mass. So let's do this. Let's put in moles equals mass over molar mass. Okay, and then let's substitute that ratio right in here. So now we have P, I'm gonna get rid of the parentheses, PM over D, right? That's on the left side, equals M over molar mass RT. Okay, now this is kind of a mess, but notice that it, there's mass on both sides, so I can divide both sides by mass, and that simplifies to pressure over density, equals RT over molar mass. And so this is one way to show this relationship between density and molar mass. This is not a convenient way to do it, but what I'll do is I'll cross multiply. So you have pressure times molar mass equals density times the gas constant times temperature, right? That's a nice little relationship. And what we can do is we can divide both sides by pressure and you get this relation. Oops, sorry, divide that by P. This is a nice relationship. What it says is that the molar mass of a gas can be determined by measuring the density. So if you have an experiment that can show you the density, right? So you weigh something, measure its volume, you have its density. Multiply that by the gas constant R, which we know, 0.08206, 2057. And then multiply it by the temperature. So if you have a thermometer, you can measure the temperature. And if you know the pressure, now you have to measure the pressure maybe with a barometer or a manometer or some other way, you would know what the pressure is as well. And you could figure out what the molar mass of the gas is. Now remember, if you can know the molar mass of something, you can, you can maybe figure out what it is. For example, oxygen has a molar mass of 32 grams per, mil, uh, 32 grams per mole or carbon dioxide has a molar mass of 44 grams per mole. So this is a nice way by measuring density, you can figure out what the molar mass is. Otherwise, you can also do this. You could divide both sides by PM, and you would have that the density is the pressure times the molar mass over RT. So if you know what gas you have in the container, you know its molar mass. For example, carbon dioxide, 44 grams per mole. Helium, 4 grams per mole. If you measure the pressure of the gas and the temperature, you can figure out what its density is well. So that's a nice way of thinking about the ideal gas law. So try some of the practice problems, try some of the sample problems, try the checkpoints and go through these. Again, these problems are not all that difficult, quite frankly, they're pretty simple. The arithmetic is easy, it's just proportionalities, plugging in numbers and looking at the units, and I think you'll find that they're, they're fun problems to do.